Thank you to HelloFresh for supporting Future Hindsight. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Hopeful12 and use code Hopeful12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. And thanks also to The Jordan Harbinger Show. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Trump is not a political neophyte in any way. He was mentored by Roy Cohn, who is both a GOP operative and the lawyer for the five crime families of New York City. And before that, of course, he was uh, Joe McCarthy's lawyer. He helped create McCarthyism, and he was one of Nixon's advisors and then one of Reagan's advisors. Welcome to Future Hindsight, a civic engagement podcast. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Our guest is Sarah Kenzior, the author of Hiding in Plain Sight, The Invention of Donald Trump and the Erosion of America. We look at the decades-long rise of the former president and the various reasons why we're not immune to the threat of authoritarianism. Our conversation starts with examining the steady weakening of democratic norms in the United States. I was born into the erosion. I have no memory of the time before it, but I think the Reagan 80s really kicked this off, both with trickle-down economics and the beginning of an incredible wealth gap. You also saw elite criminal impunity at a level that I'm not sure we'd really seen before. We were plunged into the era of Iran-Contra, a number of players of which are still active now. You also saw a kind of infotainment complex arising. The Fairness Doctrine disappeared in 1987, 24-hour cable news appeared, talk TV shows like Jerry Springer and stuff emerged in the 1990s. That may seem trivial, but I think that celebrity infotainment complex helped bring Trump to power. Because in the background of all this, you have Trump as a career criminal, posing as a businessman, posing as a tycoon, getting bailed out by transnational crime, basically, by the Russian mafia afterwards, and then having his image made over many times, first by tabloid media, then cable media, then reality TV, then social media. The story of Donald Trump tells the parallel story of America's erosion. And in the book, I showed how they intertwine, but also what it's like to be raised in this. It's sometimes hard to see it clearly when you're thrust in the midst of it. That's really true for my generation. Yeah, I think what you did really well in the book is exactly this intertwining of these two stories that are so intricately melded together. One of the things that you said that hadn't even really occurred to me, although, of course, we know about this, is that Trump has been running for office since the 80s. I think it would be really great for you to talk a little bit about his first foray in the 80s of trying to get into nuclear conversations, foreign policy and, and national security. What was it like at that time? Yeah, Trump is not a political neophyte in any way. He was mentored by Roy Cohn, who is both a GOP operative and the lawyer for the five crime families of New York City. And before that, of course, he was Joe McCarthy's lawyer. He helped create McCarthyism, and he was one of Nixon's advisors and then one of Reagan's advisors. In 1984, Trump starts talking about his interest in politics. He says Roy Cohn has encouraged him to make nice with the Soviet Union which at that time was being referred to as the evil empire by Reagan. So that's a strange thing to say. He says he wants to work with nuclear weapons and the Soviet Union. Very strange thing for a real estate tycoon to say. And then in July, July 4th, actually, 1987, Trump makes his first trip to the Kremlin. He's put up in the Lenin suite. He's treated like a king. He comes home. He starts bashing American foreign policy and says he's going to run for president. And by his side at that time was Roger Stone. And Roger Stone is another protege of Roy Cohn. Paul Manafort was also a protege of Roy Cohn. And the two of them were on board for Trump's run. Ultimately, Trump decided not to run in 1988 because he basically needs a preordained outcome. But then he flirted with a run again in 1996. He did run in 2000. He ran under the Reform Party. He had some glowing puff pieces from places like the New York Times about 
about that run. He ran in 2012 as a Republican. He had started his birtherism crusade then, drops out. And then in 2016, he felt pretty confident that he would run and he could win. And again, you see Roger Stone by his side. And that's important to remember because it really debunks this neophyte myth that the media was pushing out even in 2015 and 2016. And these are all people who know Roger Stone very well because he's somebody who works in PR, propaganda. He's a source for the media. They knew full well that Trump was not a political neophyte. He'd been implicated in numerous lawsuits. He was being investigated by the U.S. Treasury in 2015. He'd been running in mafia circles for 40 years. They decided to really play all of that down, focus on Hillary's emails, and present him as a buffoon and occasionally just as a jackass. And sometimes people will refer to this as unflattering coverage of Trump or negative coverage of Trump, but it's not because Trump's big trick is to cover up crime with scandal. He wants people to look that he said kofefe in a tweet or that he said a woman was ugly, like a, a more trivial matter that he can't be sued for. And that's the other thing he's very good at is surrounding himself with vicious lawyers who know how to manipulate the system. And then even Bill Barr. Bill Barr was Trump's personal attorney in his role as attorney general for the United States. That's not what he was supposed to be doing, but it is what he did. My big question here is about the crime. You're the only person who really talks about the transnational organized crime syndicate and how really, you know, these scandals in the media, they're just there to cover up what he's really doing behind closed doors. So how does his enterprise work in the way that you understand it? I wish I fully knew the answer to that question. Trump is a front man for this operation. He's a showman. He's somebody who understands propaganda and PR. He understands how to protect himself from litigation. But it's other people behind him that are the real operators, people like Roger Stone, Manafort, Steve Bannon. But there are also deeper ties. Trump is connected to the Jeffrey Epstein, Jelaine Maxwell, child rape trafficking operation that was used to black male heads of state and other powerful figures around the world. I do think that the Epstein case and his role in espionage and blackmail is at the heart of this. Alex Acosta, who eventually became Trump's secretary of labor, said that Epstein worked for intelligence and he didn't specify whose intelligence. And my guess is that he was working as an operator for multiple countries. The key thing to understand here is that these are transnational actors. They don't have loyalty to a particular state. And that's why it's very dangerous when they're in charge of a nation state, because they don't care whether it exists. A lot of people called Trump a fascist because he employed a number of fascist tactics. But Trump didn't care if the United States survived. They see the state as something to sell, something to strip down for parts. You definitely see this in the aftermath of the um, collapse of the Soviet Union. I think that's the role model for this group of transnational criminal actors. There's other connections there. One of them is to the operation run by Semyon Mogilevich, who is the head of the Russian mafia. He was connected to Epstein and he is connected to a number of figures surrounding Trump. And the government for a while was really cracking down on Mogilevich. He was on the top 10 FBI's most wanted list. He was very abruptly taken off of it when Trump was running for office in 2015. James Comey removed him, replaced him with kind of a run of the mill bank robber. It's a very strange thing to do. And I think the reason that all of this is happening and that there's this lack of accountability is that, as Mueller himself said, white collar crime, state corruption and organized crime has blurred to such an extent that our institutions are compromised and broken. And it's very difficult to even know who will bring justice, who's not implicated in this system, who can rise above it and really hold these incredibly wealthy, incredibly powerful people who've been operating for decades unchecked accountable. So that adds up to a very complicated situation. But all I can say is this is not who you want as the president of the United States, because all they're going to do, and this is what Trump did, is abuse that executive privilege to enhance personal wealth, but to also ingratiate this corrupt criminal network deep into the heart of of American governance, purging out good people, packing it with loyalists. And that's what Biden is contending with now. 
maybe a good question here is about the level of corruption in the United States at all levels of government. And you start your book with the story of Missouri because it's so exemplary of what happens throughout the United States afterwards. How does the recent history of the state provide a template for what is happening nationwide when we talk about dark money, gerrymandering, and all of those things combined? I live in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm represented simultaneously by Cori Bush and Josh Hawley, which shows you the extent of the political spectrum in Missouri. It's not as simple as people say. We're a state with intense gerrymandering, voter suppression, and most alarmingly, we have a state legislature that just blatantly overrules the will of the people. Like, for example, in 2018, there were a number of ballot initiatives, things like raising the minimum wage, protecting labor unions, and most importantly, getting rid of dark money in politics and making donors unable to stay anonymous. Missouri is the dark money capital of America. Tons of money gets flooded into our politicians and their campaigns. We don't know who's influencing and controlling our elected officials. No one likes it. And so we all voted to get rid of the dark money, raise the wage and protect the labor unions. And the state legislature is just like, nah. And they, they just overruled the whole thing. They don't care what we voted for. You know, our bill called Clean Missouri was thrown out. And I worry that Missouri is the bellwether of American decline. You know, we were always the bellwether state. If you wanted to predict how a national election would turn out, you'd look at Missouri because it always picked the winner. And now Missouri is just this cesspool of corruption because there's been no accountability. Put at a national level, that's very dangerous. And I think it's what the GOP wants wants to do. That's why they are trying to eliminate voting rights. And they're also just doing brazenly illegal things, tossing out ballot initiatives that people voted on or pushing Democratic officials who were elected aside and saying, no, you're not actually in this position. It's not how we should be functioning. And it is a, a form of autocracy. And I worry it will congeal fully into a national autocracy, especially if a Republican is elected as president again. In terms of accountability of these people, meaning Republicans who are elected, they're very different than people who are Russian mobsters. How is it that we have not been able to hold them accountable? What's missing? I mean, I'm not sure they are that different. I don't see a huge dividing line between plutocrats and oligarchs. The difference between us and Russia used to be the strength of rule of law in the United States and this long democratic tradition of freedom of speech, free media, which Russia did not have. But I think when you're looking at white collar crime, when you're looking at people using threats and bribes and blackmail to get what they want, I don't think that the US and Russia are so different, which is why I think that the sleaziest of Republicans and some Democrats as well were so willing to work with Russian mafiosos and with very corrupt oligarchs from that region. And the other thing that troubles me, especially now that my Senator Roy Blunt, as a Republican, he's not as bad as my other Senator, Josh Hawley, who called for an insurrection on our government. Anyway, Blunt's not running in 2022. So everyone's wondering who's going to be the new senator. And they're bringing up Eric Greitens, who used to be our governor. And he was indicted twice while in office, once for tying up a woman in his basement to a piece of exercise equipment and photographing her half naked and then blackmailing her with the photos. He also stole from a veterans charity. He had an app that deleted all of his official communications. He did all sorts of terrible stuff. So you would think that guy's career should be over. We are now at the point where someone can commit multiple felonies while in office and they're thought of as the leading candidate for Senate in 2022, because there is no accountability. And the Republicans have such a monopoly on the state because of gerrymandering, dark money, propaganda, so many different factors. It's led people to feel very hopeless. It's troubling that he could even be thought of as a plausible candidate when honestly, he should be in prison. And the fact that he's not is itself an indictment of this state and its system. We'll be back with the rest of our conversation with Sarah in a moment. But I wanted to take a minute to thank our sponsor, HelloFresh. Are you tired of ordering delivery every day or cooking the same meals over and over again? Maybe you need to learn some new recipes to impress a special someone? Whatever your reasons are, I have an answer. 
HelloFresh. It's a meal kit that lets you enjoy restaurant quality dishes and ingredients for 70% less than it costs to eat out. They're offering you 12 free meals, including free shipping, when you go to HelloFresh.com slash Hopeful12 and use code Hopeful12. HelloFresh ships ingredients from farms to you in less than a week, so you know they're fresh. They offer quick, contact-free delivery right to your doorstep for easy home cooking and to avoid stressful trips to the grocery store. Best of all, HelloFresh is easily customizable, allowing you to add extra servings, skip weeks and double up on favorite recipes. I'm looking forward to try their bavette steak and mushroom sauce, so stay tuned and I'll let you know how it was. To get started, go to HelloFresh.com slash Hopeful12 and use code Hopeful12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Happy cooking! Thank you also to Jordan Harbinger and his podcast, The Jordan Harbinger Show. Jordan is a great podcaster who produces fantastic interview content for his show multiple times a week. As the host of an interview podcast myself, I know how difficult it can be to ask the right questions, parse the right information, and create engaging content with someone else's story. Jordan's show jumps these hurdles with ease, providing fascinating episodes that delve deep into the minds of the world's best and brightest. Whether you're learning investment tricks, hearing how MI5 catches terrorists, or finding out what it's like to live on the space station, the Jordan Harbinger show does not disappoint. I really enjoy this show and think you will as well. There's just so much here. Check out jordanharbinger.com slash start for some episode recommendations or search for The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. One of the things that you mentioned in the book, which I thought was really an illustration of sort of the temperature of voters in Missouri is that they voted in 2018 on clean Missouri, on minimum wage, all these good things. But then they continue to also elect Republicans. What's going on in these minds of the people of Missouri that they can do both of those things at the same time and not understand that Republicans will not enact the things that they voted on in 2018? Yes, it's a very weird paradox that we're dealing with. And I think there's a kind of fluidity to Missouri party affiliations. There are Republicans in Missouri who have grown to think that basically there's no place for Democrats in Missouri, that it's this party of elitists or radicals. They tried to paint Claire McCaskill, of all people, as some sort of like Antifa radical, whereas in reality, she was one of the more conservative Democrats in the Senate. There's also the element of racism where we're a state that has two large cities, St. Louis and Kansas City, that are historically black, that have black representation, black leadership. And then we have the rest of the state, which tends to be white, more rural and more Republican. And I think that these categories of races and parties got solidified in people's minds. So there's racism toward the Democratic candidates. One thing that bothers me is that we tend to be blown off a lot as a state. And this is true of so many states just labeled red states. The National Democratic Party has no interest in us. They think that we're a lost cause, even though Obama lost Missouri by about 3,000 votes in 2008. We historically have been a state that switched back and forth between Republican and Democrat. There's very little investment in our candidates, in our political infrastructure, in helping us maintain our voting rights. The Republicans aren't wrong when they say the National Democratic Party really looks down on Missouri, and that's painful. And so I think there's an element of resentment in that respect. They like the idea of a fighter and somebody who's kind of giving the state its due. Psychologically, this is dangerous. People vote with their emotions. They don't always vote according to policy or common sense or any of these other things. Whoever runs in 2022 has to capture that emotional impulse and just say, we're not going to abandon you. We're going to have your back whoever you are, whatever your party affiliation is, and seem strong and seem sincere, I think that maybe would go a long way through breaking through the propaganda hole that's on so many people in Missouri. 
Yeah, the propaganda is everywhere. It's very difficult to undo it. In fact, you write at length about the architecture of the internet and social media and how this setup has further empowered authoritarianism. And maybe in our current day and age. The best example is a widespread dissemination in mainstream news channels of the big lie that the election was stolen. So right now, despite the impeachments and the attempted coup, how can we actually combat this type of propaganda? Well, I mean, what's frustrating is we have the representatives that have been promoting the stop the steal big lie, this lie that Biden stole the election on TV. They get invited onto cable news and they're not corrected in real time. Like, I don't know why they'd even be on. But if you are going to invite them, you need to correct them right away. That isn't happening. We also have the loss of local media that's been accelerating enormously since 2008. And it's caused people to turn to outlets like, say, Fox News instead of looking at their local paper. And when you have something like, say, the coronavirus pandemic, that makes an enormous difference. If there had been local media still around last year that people would not have believed lies about the virus not being dangerous. If there had been a victim of the virus, they would have been written about in the local paper and people would have trusted that paper and trusted that reporter and trusted the media. Like, now hardly anyone trusts the media. And I don't blame them at all because the media lies all the time. So from my own perspective, I'm sympathetic to that. So that kind of trust needs to be rebuilt. Lies need to be debunked. There needs to be greater, more diverse representation in every sense of who works in journalism, what kind of stories are being told, who is going on TV to give their opinions. You're not getting the full perspective of American life. Again, this is a thing that builds resentment and also creates apathy. You get the sense that no one cares if you're suffering, no one cares how you're doing. And that's, you know, basically true. A lot of media outlets, they just seem to exist to compete with each other and to make money instead of to serve the public. And I think the public is very aware of that. And so all that could be changed. But honestly, it just keeps getting worse. More and more people keep getting laid off. It gets more and more sensationalized for ratings. That's why Trump was such a boon for them. And until they decide, consciously to change their employment practices and the way that news is delivered, I think this is just going to uh, worsen our political climate. It can be changed. It's just a matter of working kind of outside the boundaries of what people expect from us and just doing our best to tell the truth anyway, despite the obstacles. Yeah, that's definitely true. So I have a question about American exceptionalism because I think about this all the time. It's created this blind spot for us uh, in a way that we believe that we're this exceptional country where bad things don't happen. And so what is the role of American exceptionalism in actually mainstreaming corruption and somebody like Donald Trump? Yeah, I think American exceptionalism played a huge role in mainstreaming corruption and making people think that autocracy could not happen here and that we were an enduring democracy, that nothing could ever break us. And it's ridiculous because every country is vulnerable to this. There are no exceptional countries in this respect. And also, we've been watching the systematic breakdown of our institutions for several decades. We're in an interlude that may well be an interlude between two autocracies, the aspiring one of Trump and a more entrenched one of whoever comes. Or we may be able to go another way, especially if we pass Voting Rights Acts and other things that strengthen our representative democracy and our institutions. But to do that, you have to admit that American exceptionalism is a myth. You have to admit that all of these institutions are broken. And then you're able to try to fix them. And that takes an enormous amount of work uh, and a great deal of humility. I do think it's possible. And I do think we've broken through some of that mythology, especially along racial issues. That's something that's changed dramatically. We still have a long way to go. Yeah, indeed. I have a question about your scholarship. You're an expert in authoritarianism in Central Asia and specifically Uzbekistan. So what have you seen in the things that you have chronicled and studied that could maybe provide a strategy for us to get out of this morass or even at least the first step? 
I think it's worth it for Americans to learn the history of the Soviet Union and its collapse and what happened to successor states like Uzbekistan. Because at heart, these are kleptocracies. These are the rule of thieves. Uzbekistan it was one of the most extreme dictatorships in the world. And so it's unusual in that respect. What was not unusual is the sheer level of corruption that elites, especially in the government, engaged in. And you also see this in Azerbaijan in Kazakhstan and Russia and all sorts of countries, the way they operate in terms of corruption, white collar crime, mafia rule is extremely similar to how Trump operated. And this is in part because Trump was trained by the Russian mafia and literally working with them. When Trump first emerged, he reminded me so much of the flamboyant dictators from Central Asia, especially somebody like Turkmenbashi, as he was called, the former ruler of Turkmenistan, who had built a golden statue of himself that revolved to face the sun. When I saw Trump's statue at CPAC, I was like, oh my God, and now he actually has it. He has the golden statue. You know, but it's worth looking at these personality at the crime and also at the fact that even though citizens do rise up in these countries, they often lose. And it's a very painful experience. So we need to treasure the rights that we have. Like I know people living in places like Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, they would love to have the freedom of speech we have, the free media we have, the freedom of assembly that we have. They don't have that. They don't have the opportunity even to fix the problems that they are enduring. And so we should appreciate that. And also to get back to American exceptionalism, realize we're not so different. And here's what happens when this goes on and on and on for decades. That's the story of Uzbekistan. So as an everyday person, what are two things I could do to not ever let an authoritarian and a crook like Trump come to power again? One, I would say, like, get involved in local politics. We recently had a win in Missouri for Cori Bush, who seemed like she could never take office. She was a Ferguson frontline activist. People deemed her too radical. Now she's in Congress. Keep up with what's going on around you. If you're in a state where you feel like things are going fine, throw your money to the other states and other candidates that are scrapping to survive. I'm alarmed at what I'm seeing because I think people did a very good job in 2020 of mobilizing, organizing, getting out the vote. And now that Trump is out, people are kind of kicking back at a time where they should be on guard. And I completely understand why this is happening. Like everyone is exhausted, but it's important to just try to keep your own moral compass intact and remember what you deserve. Remember what all of these politicians who are in power now in the Democratic Party, what they promised. And don't just settle for less because it's not Trump. Like if they said they were going to bring a $15 minimum wage and relieve student debt and all of these other very popular propositions, push them. Don't build personality cults around the Democratic Party. That's another really bad, dangerous tendency I've seen in American politics. I see it growing around Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, and others. They are public servants. They're here to serve us. They're not there to be worshipped by us. And it's absolutely fine to criticize them and to make suggestions and to try to push them in the direction you want. You know, that's what representative democracy is. And so I hope folks remember that because I think the shock of Trump has caused people to lower expectations. I don't think that's a healthy move. Yeah, I totally agree. Although I think Biden is trying really hard not to be this person, despite what other people may be doing around him. So what are the biggest risks that we still face? And what are your thoughts on like, where does Trumpism go and where does the organized crime go? All of the big perpetrators that were involved in Trump's 2016 election heist and a bunch of associated crimes were pardoned. And a bunch of them participated in the violent capital coup. They helped organize it. This includes Steve Bannon, Roger Stone, Michael Flynn, Manafort. These are incredibly violent, dangerous people active in our political system and just walking around unencumbered. And I don't know what they're up to anymore. But in terms of other dangers, the the main thing I'm worried about right now the attack on voting rights. The Republicans saw what Stacey Abrams and grassroots organizers were able to pull off in Georgia, making it a Democratic state that voted for Biden. And so now they're trying to pass incredibly repressive, restrictive laws in each state that will basically prevent the Democrats from ever winning an election again. 
in holding power, which is why it's very important that the Voting Rights Act is passed. And for that to happen, it seems they have to get rid of the filibuster. So I hope they do that. I hope they don't settle. I hope they realize that if they don't do that, we will be headed down the path of autocracy. And I don't know if that will mean a return of Trump, but I'll leave it at that. Here's my last question. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? I think the level of civic awareness and the ways that people are looking out for each other, that's been encouraging over the last few years. You know, there's an element of, I don't know, cruelty in the pandemic. I think people are very irritable. They're fed up with each other. But I've seen so many just quiet acts of kindness, giving people money to be able to survive. People basically trying to patch up a destroyed social safety net on their own. When I see people just voluntarily, without prompting, looking out for each other, It makes me think, wow, you know, if people are doing so much with so little, like what could they do if they had more? If they weren't constantly terrified about the rug being pulled out from under them, if they weren't constantly discriminated against or under assault, you know, our country and our our society could be capable of really great things. We just have to have some kind of baseline level of security to go forward. And I think that there's an acknowledgement now that that is indeed necessary. We may have hit bottom to some extent. Uh, you know, the, the pandemic plus the autocracy plus the coup, the collapsing economy it is in a way hitting bottom. And I think people see that and they're thinking of solutions and they're maybe thinking of just better ways to live our life. So that makes me somewhat hopeful. <sighs> Well, I hope you're right that we have somewhat hit the bottom. There are so many things that have gone wrong. I don't know what else could fall out now. And so I hope you're right. And I'm also hopeful. (laughs) I am very hopeful, actually. The murder hornets. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. The murder hornets and the UFOs are going to make their play now. This is the time. (laughs) I I did see something about UFOs recently. And I was like, what? No, not now. (laughs) This is not the right time. (laughs) Part of me was like, no, now, now. Like, take me off of this planet, please. (laughs) Exit planet, exit planet. I totally hear you. Exactly. (laughs) Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed our conversation and I hope that we have turned the corner. I hope so too. Thank you so much. The part of this conversation that still lingers in my mind is about American exceptionalism, about how our fervent belief in being special prevents us from realizing that we're not so different than other countries. We're not immune to corruption or to becoming an autocracy. The good news is that we really don't have to become the next Uzbekistan. To admit that American exceptionalism is a myth may be difficult, but we can nonetheless be committed to demanding accountability, combat corruption, defend and expand voting rights. Our best bet in preventing unqualified corrupt would-be autocrats to come to power is constant civic engagement from all our citizens. Next week, our guest is Andy Norman, the author of Mental Immunity, Infectious Ideas, Mind Parasites, and The Search for a Better Way to Think. He offers tools to inoculate our minds against the worst forms of ideological contagion. The famed Socratic method, where you test ideas with questions and see how they fare and let go of them if they don't withstand scrutiny, that that method is actually one of the most beautiful and powerful mind inoculants ever invented. We can enhance it and turn it into something that goes even further in the direction of inoculating minds against the worst forms of cognitive contagion. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for continuing to listen to Future Hindsight. Our executive producer is Mila Atmos, the audio producer is Peter Fedak, and our associate producers are Miriam Zumbul and Brooke Sion. Be sure to listen to us on Apple Podcasts, futurehindsight.com, or wherever you enjoy podcasts every week. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.